So, my next speaker, Justin Oakley, two of my favorite professions in one person, both a bioethicist and a philosopher, which is pretty amazing. He is Deputy Director of the Monash Bioethics Center and has authored and co-authored quite a number of works. These include Morality and the Emotions, Virtue Ethics and Professional Roles, and Bioethics. I took an essay, so I believe I haven't read it. Um, he is editor of Informed Consent and Clinician Accountability, the Ethics of Report Cards on Surgeon Performance, and he's co-author of the quarterly referee journal Monash Bioethics Review. He has published articles in international journals on the ethics of clinical trials, informed consent, surrogate motherhood, whistleblowing, reproductive cloning, and all sorts of other spicy topics in ethical theory. So today, I believe he'll be talking about antimicrobial resistance, which has become a major global health concern, as many people here will know. Um, Justin will also explain virtue ethics, which he's been a major proponent of lately, um, and for a while, a while now, and indicate how it differs from other ethical theories. Uh, he will discuss some key patient-centered medical virtues and several candidate community-centered medical virtues uh, before considering what sorts of antimicrobial prescribing policies these might suggest physicians. Uh, so once again, we will have questions via the same URL. Um, so Justin, thank you very much. Let's give it up. about just over 20 minutes so there's a bit of time for questions at the end uh, and as David said you know over the years a lot of my work has been on virtue ethics and one of the concerns that people have had about virtue ethics is that it tends to be very individualistic uh, it tends to focus very much on what an individual agent can do whether they be a general citizen or I guess with a lot of the students I teach the master of bioethics course doctors and so I thought that um, just in the last few years, I, I've been doing a lot of work on policy and uh, I thought it might be useful if I said a little bit more about the way that virtue ethics can offer some policy advice here about a problem that's of enormous significance, I think, for the world, not only in terms of altruism and I guess also preventing harm, but in terms of what individual doctors can do too. So it's a bit of a two-way street what I'll be talking about here because it has an impact both on the individual decisions of doctors, but also, I think, for policy makers. One of the main points that I'll be talking about, and I hope to, to be useful um, here, is looking at the way that you can connect work on cognitive biases with particular virtues. And so thinking about what does the evidence indicate are the most prevalent cognitive biases in a particular area, such as antibiotic prescribing, uh, and what, what do we already know about those biases and ways of counteracting them? So I think some of this work, um, from my perspective, ties in with the idea of practical intelligence as an aspect of every virtue. And so I think considering that practical intelligence in terms of awareness of one's sort of cognitive biases and learning about ways of counteracting them is perhaps a more generalisable lesson from the talk that I'm going to give. Okay, but um, just before I do that, I was asked to, because it's a general session, to say a little bit about ethical theory and you know, three approaches to ethics so that I can locate virtue ethics within those. Um, so I thought I might start by saying a little bit about utilitarianism and then a bit about Kantian ethics. And um, sorry, then I'll talk about virtue ethics. So as a lot of you would know, utilitarianism is a theory that uh, works out what actions are right according to what will maximise utility. Uh, its founding father, I suppose you could say, is Jeremy Bentham, who some of you might have seen. Uh, what's left of his body there at University College London gets wheeled in to staff meetings once a year in accordance with his will. So if you haven't seen it, you might want to go and have a look. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that maximises utility or not, but uh, he um, certainly uh, yeah, he's an odd guy. And so, um, <laughs> And you can see. But his idea, which has been taken up by contemporary utilitarians, you know, people like Peter Singer, who did one last night, um, you know, th their idea is that the right thing to do is to try and produce the greatest good to the greatest number. And I suppose a lot of you would be aware that there are different ways of spelling out um, you know, how to measure that and what that consists in. So, you know, commonly these days, you find utilitarians. Uh, you know, understanding well-being and welfare and utility in terms of preference satisfaction, 
it's an approach that Peter has pioneered. Um, although it's recently changed to uh, understand that sort of well-being and utility in, in terms of what you might call hedonistic utilitarianism. Um, so uh, let me move on from that to uh, Kantian ethics. And I think all three of these approaches that I'll be talking about can support the importance of altruism, but they have different ways of going about it, and I think they do sometimes lead to different conclusions. So we can perhaps contrast the utilitarian approach with a kind of rights-based approach you know, to ethics. Again, Bentham was, um, amongst other things, famous for saying that natural rights are like nonsense upon stills. So he didn't really believe in natural rights approaches to ethics. But um, you know, Kant himself didn't really have a natural rights approach, but was more based on the idea of reasoning and humans as having a rational capacity and being entitled to a certain respect. Uh, where, you know, which would make it wrong to be used as a mere means um, on the basis of that reasoning capacity. So Kant thought that through um, understanding what principles can be, as he put it, universalised, uh, that we're able to figure out um, a framework of principles that we can use to guide our lives. Not perhaps in a way that's quite as demanding as utilitarianism, so it's more like a a kind of framework within which we uh, can do all kinds of things. We have the freedom to do all kinds of things. Um, but both utilitarians and Kantians believe in a strong sort of duty of beneficence, if you want to put it that way, of the importance of sort of acting to help strangers in distress. And so I think both of them, uh, it's possible to find support for effective altruism from both those theories. And then if I compare it with virtue ethics, this is an approach that goes back to the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. And it's very much focused on what sort of person you are. So in some ways it's a more holistic approach to ethics than thinking just about rules and principles or perhaps thinking about what action is going to have the greatest utility. Uh, but it's also about what sort of person you show yourself to be and the way you act. Now, of course, anyone can say that, and I suppose if you take the Aristotelian approach to ethics or Aristotelian approach to virtue ethics, it's really based on the idea of a flourishing life for a human being. Um, some philosophers like Martha Nussbaum have done a lot with that idea and have developed the capabilities approach to well-being. And so the kind of goal of it is not only, I think, to perhaps help oneself to have a flourishing life, but also you know, to enable others to live a flourishing life too. So although virtue ethics is not quite as demanding as utilitarianism in that it doesn't think you've acted wrongly where you've done something that is excellent but is nonetheless not the very best thing you could do, it is still pretty demanding when it comes to helping others, I think. Let me explain then that demandingness by looking at this problem of antimicrobial resistance and the role that doctors' prescribing decisions can play in that. So I, I think a lot of you would be aware of this kind of global problem where it seems that the antibiotics that are commonly prescribed to patients are becoming um, less and less effective uh, in those patients and doctors are having to resort to antibiotics which previously were only used as a last resort. Um, and it's, I think, because of, the, of what we're finding, the increasing limitations and increase, uh, perhaps decreasing effectiveness of antibiotics, uh, that you know, people are dying from this, from diseases that were treatable, that were eminently treatable uh, even 10, 20 years ago by antibiotics that are not so treatable now. So I've got some more examples here. The slides have got a lot of details on them. Uh, I think the slides are going to go up on the website at some stage, so yeah, perhaps if you're interested, I don't know if you need to take notes from all of this, but um, rather than perhaps going into the details of those harms anymore, let me go on and tell you a little bit about some efforts to try to remediate this and to do something about it. Um, so there's a set of, sort of professional guidelines that are used to try to combat um, the tendency that a lot of doctors have to over-prescribe antibiotics. And I think it's perhaps a natural tendency, understandable one for doctors to, you know, as their first, um, perhaps first response, 
when a patient presents with what you know might look to be perhaps with a throat infection to say well you know especially if the patient is kind of expecting to be prescribed an antibiotic um, I think a lot of doctors will respond by just you know, going and prescribing it but again there's been a lot of education um, of doctors about these dangers um, that you need to be more selective in your antibiotic prescribing decisions and, and so it, it, it seems that despite the efforts of professional associations to discourage antibiotic overprescribing, um, th those efforts have often themselves been rather ineffective. So, um, if we take one particular study as an example, uh, this is an Australian study that included antibiotics that prescribed for acute respiratory infections at rates four to, four to nine times as high as those that are recommended by the clinical guidelines. Um, so that was a study that was published last year. So we want to know a bit more about this and what might we learn about you know, the psychology of sort of prescribing, the medical prescribing, um, from thinking about studies of you know, things like cognitive biases and their roles and virtues. So you know, as I um, kind of gestured at right at the beginning, I've done a lot of work over the years on virtue ethics in practice, and you know, I'm a great believer in the Feel like the value of a theory being shown by what sort of answers it gives in practice rather than just thinking about whether it's <coughs> theoretically elegant or, or not. Um, so I see this problem of um, dealing with anti, antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic prescribing as a good test case, perhaps, for the acceptability of virtue ethics. Um, now, um, sometimes when you go back to Aristotle and you think of virtues, it's very much, you know, what are the character traits that you need in order to flourish generally in your life? But I think what's helpful when you apply that approach to professional roles is that, you know, each profession has a distinctive goal. Um, we can think about, for example, you know, the goal of health or healing patients. Uh, you know, for doctors, we can think about the goal of justice for lawyers. And the idea of applying virtue ethics to professional roles is to try to figure out what character traits will enable that particular professional to serve that goal. So there have been accounts developed in the last you know, 20 or 30 years of sort of medical virtues generally. One key one is medical beneficence, I think, so having a disposition to act in the best interests of patients. Over the years I've done a lot of work on trying to figure out exactly what that requires a doctor to do. But I think what's different about this problem that I'm talking about today is that, you, that a good doctor, a virtuous doctor, needs not only to have those patient-centred virtues, but also needs to have, if you like, the community-centred medical virtues as well, such as justice. So I want to talk uh, about what being a just doctor actually requires of you in your antibiotic prescribing decisions. Okay, um, so I've got a slide here with some details about so-called clinically inappropriate prescribing decisions that are made by doctors. Um, and so these are some studies from the US, but I think we can learn from them in Australia as well. And um, they indicate just how um, sort of bad the problem is, the extent of this inappropriate prescribing. But what I thought was, was interesting about the study that was published last year, McCullough and others, 2017, was they looked at survey data from 2010 to 2015 on antibiotic prescribing rates in general practice. And uh, they found Australian GPs are prescribing antibiotics for acute, acute respiratory infections at rates up to nine times higher than those that are recommended by the national guidelines. Um, and the co-author Chris Del Mar said he felt that doctors are acting out of a misplaced sense of caution, as many conditions that require treatment with antibiotics share similar symptoms to those that don't. And so doctors need to stop considering a prescription for antibiotics as their first port of call. So he also said the idea that we have as GPs that writing a prescription for antibiotics just in case is probably not so effective that in fact not using antibiotics at all is actually safe. You don't end up with missed cases of meningitis and many of disease and all sorts of really nasty things. So I think there's a tendency, and I think you see this particularly in junior doctors, to be overcautious, and it takes time to learn, for them to learn to trust their judgment in some cases and just to sort of pull back at times. So let me expand on that a little bit. Um, and just to locate this in the context of virtue ethics is there's this 
idea that Christine Swanton, a New Zealand philosopher, has come up with, that every sort of virtuous impulse, if you like, has its proper target. And so we can think of, uh, you know, doctors, I suppose people say medicine, um, is a poor fit for virtue ethics because medical practice is full of well-intentioned bungling do-gooders. Um, well, if we use this idea of there being a target to every virtue, you can think, well, okay, what counts as actually successfully hitting that target? Um, so let me expand on that. And to maybe bring in this idea of practical wisdom, practical intelligence, as it's often called now, you know, how can that be used to hone one's virtuous impulses? So the beneficent impulses that a doctor has, or even the impulses to act, if you like, justly, how can that be honed so that it has a better chance of hitting its target? So this is the idea of phrenesis that goes back to Aristotle, but what I'm doing with it now, and what quite a number of contemporary virtue ethicists are doing with it, is to say, well, let's have a look at ways in which you know, good impulses can fail to hit their proper targets. And one clear obstacle, if you like, that undermines a good impulse hitting its target are um, a range of cognitive biases. But if you put cognitive bias into Google, you come up with more than 100 of them. So obviously, what we need to be guided by and what the studies indicate are the prevalent cognitive um, biases in that area of practice. There's lots, over the last two or three years, a lot of studies coming out on this, which you know, I found really interesting and useful. I'll be talking about some of them next. OK. Um, a lot of you would be aware of you know, cognitive biases more generally, but as I mentioned, I think it's useful to understand those that seem to be you know, particularly kind of disruptive and undermining in a certain area of practice, such as in drug prescribing. Um, so there was an interesting qualitative study that was done, uh, which seems to suggest that doctors, were, when they were prescribing antibiotics, were influenced by what you might call authority bias. Um, so in each of the slides, I've highlighted the relevant bias in red. Um, so they showed an undue deference towards the antibiotic prescribing practices of their supervisor rather than um, you know, having the courage, maybe, to you know, go out on a bit of a limb there. And so you know, the researchers mentioned that barriers to evidence-based prescribing included role modelling outdated practices or setting a precedent of prescribing that created patient expectations and pressure on the registrar. And so, for example, one of them said, I do know one supervisor in particular will give his patients antibiotics, even for something that sounds very viral. And therefore, when I see his patients, I feel I'm expected to do that as well because his patients have been seeing for many years, so they expect it too. And so I'm definitely more likely to give his patients antibiotics, even when I don't think it's justified. So the patterns that are set up by one's you know, superiors or one's um, employers. Another cognitive bias, I found this a fascinating study actually, is you might even not even think of it as a bias, but it turns out that your chances of getting an antibiotic uh, improve later in the day. Um, so the longer a doctor has been working on their shift, the more they, the theory is they suffer from this sort of decision fatigue and they'll just be not very inclined to say yes if you go in there perhaps requesting an antibody. Uh, so the time of day affects your chances of getting an antibody. Uh, and th these, the, the, those sorts of biases and those sorts of concerns um, are ones that are relevant to the virtue of medical beneficence, so that's a patient-centred virtue. But I also mentioned that I was going to say something about community-centred sort of medical virtues, like justice is one of them. Um, also, I think another community-centred medical virtue is a readiness to serve the community and not just pick and choose the sort of patients that you see on the basis of personal preference. Um, so let me talk about justice, though, in, um, for a couple of slides, and the biases that can undermine the virtue of justice from hitting its proper targets in this context. Um, so the kind of case I wanted to focus on, which is probably you know, the trickiest sort of case from an ethical point of view, is one where it would seem to be, other things being equal, in the patient's best interest to be prescribed an antibiotic. But it looks like that antibiotic might be of marginal benefit to the patient. And so what ought the virtuous doctor to do there? And I think in the sort of case that I'll have briefly describe in a moment, I think the virtuous doctor sometimes should not um, be prescribed the antibiotic, that even where it seems to be in the best interest of this patient, 
but um, the broader community, the broader moral universe, if you like, uh, and the harms that I mentioned at the start are better protected if we don't prescribe in cases like this. And so, I mean, it would be nice if doctors, if all doctors had to do was focus on what is in the best interest of this patient, I think, and, and that was enough to guide them. But I think sometimes um, there'll be patients who miss out on antibiotics uh, that might be best for them when a doctor acting for the virtue of justice you know, decides, um, makes the kind of decision they should make in a case like this. Uh, so, um, so these are cases where it seems like prescribing antibiotic is of marginal benefit to a patient. So I suppose a child presents to their doctor with acute otitis media with an ear infection. Prescribing antibiotic in these cases would appear likely to confer marginal benefits to the child. But there's a lot of evidence that, that there seems to be uh, just an absolute reduction in pain in only 5% of cases, and a lot of these cases result spontaneously. Um, you know, 17 children must be treated to prevent one child having some pain up to two days, and antibiotics have no effect on human problems or on complications. So, you know, even though that might sound, yeah, that might sound challenging for parents who've got a child who's screaming from a very painful ear infection, it's the, the advice is um, here, I think, would be to treat the pain, to treat the symptoms, um, but not to prescribe an antibiotic. In terms of biases, then, I suppose I should bring this to a close pretty quickly. You know, for me, probably of all the biases that I've mentioned and others I could mention, this is the one that might be most relevant to effective altruism more generally, which you can think of as a sort of overconfidence bias. Um, and if you look at the study that I've quoted here, uh, it suggests that um, this is the last of the studies that I mentioned, the AVO one. So doctors give insufficient weight to their own contributions to antimicrobial resistance. Uh, uh, where most of the respondents expressed concern about the problem of antimicrobial resistance, uh, but the researchers found that while 62% of respondents agreed that other doctors over prescribe antibiotics, only 13% agreed that they themselves over prescribe antibiotics. So it's like, it's not me who's doing it. Yeah, it's a problem, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not contributing to it. So um, I think, you know, I don't think everyone can be right there. Uh, okay, what I might do, because I want to try and bring this to a close, is um, just very briefly you know, give you two examples of what can be done here. Because maybe the impression I've given you and that often you know, virtue ethics gives you is that it's all down to you as an individual. But I think it's really important that individual attempts to raise one's bias awareness and do something about it um, need to be complemented by efforts by institutions and governments to help people um, with that job. Um, so there's um, a wonderful website the Australian government put up called Choosing Wisely, which gives <laughs> doctors and patients examples, of, if you like, the limits of good medical practice, such as not prescribing antibiotics for acute bronchitis. And finally, this is a fascinating study that was done by what's called a nudge unit, sort of it's a lay term for in the UK, looking at how people can be nudged to make better decisions. In this context, um, it was, uh, there was a study done that looked at what are the highest antibiotic overprescribers in the UK. The nudge unit sent them a letter and said to them, um, do you realise that you are prescribing, or 80% you know, of practices in your local area prescribe fewer antibiotics per head than yours? And the 2016 Lancet publication looked at how effective that was, and that massively reduced the antibiotic overprescribing in that practice. But just knowing where you sit in a distribution um, is really important, just actually motivating you to change your practice. Um, I'll stop there. That's a list of references there if you're interested in reading further, and uh, hopefully we've got a little time questions. So, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Four minutes until the first tea break. Um, a very popular question, which is a bit of a two-parter, so we'll definitely get time for that. And then I would very much encourage you to all pursue and hand Justin later and ask him more questions, because clearly we just got to scratch the surface. Um, so why would you say it makes sense to apply a virtue ethics framework versus something like utilitarianism or, or Kantian ethics? And, and sort of like the follow-up from that, what differences in prescription recommendations come from this versus other popular ethical frameworks? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think the sort of conclusions that I've been arguing for here could be endorsed 
you know, by utilitarianism and by perhaps a range of you know, different approaches to ethics. One of the reasons, just sort of cut a bit of a long story short here, one of the reasons that I think that virtue ethics has got something distinctive to offer here is because, you know, there have been changes to therapeutic guidelines. They haven't really had much of an impact. And, you know, doctors need to think a little bit more about, you know, their own psychology um, in their own prescribing decisions. So, um, again, I think it's something utilitarianism could support, um, but it tends not not until recently anyway, to say so much about the sort of you know, the psychology of actions. Um, so that's, I suppose, a quick answer. But, um, and, yeah, I mean, sort of thinking about the way that virtue ethics can be more empirically informed by studies of you know, not only cognitive biases, but, um, you know, how other people are behaving and what their reasons are in these sorts of cases, I think, is really useful. Um, and so I mean that's something that's failing you as well. Um, that's to, just yeah. a quick answer, yeah. Um, so Justin, what, what do you make of the Chinese system where doctors, this is new to me, are currently paid by how little the patients need to see them? <laughs> <laughs> they're paid by how little their patients need to see them. So you get more money as a doctor if you've got a patient who's coming in for like a social chat that doesn't have any sort of mental problem? Uh, so the, the less often your patient comes in, it seems like oh, the more you would get. Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if um, I can see some sort of unintended bad consequences of an approach like that. But I, I think, you know, uh, at least a lot of medical students I teach these days in Monash seem to be um, aware that you know medicine and taking you know drugs or whatever is not always the answer, the best um, approach to a problem. But yeah, that seems to me to be a bit of a kind of sledgehammer to deal with a problem like that. You know, to sort of totally redesign the system in that way. I guess, but yeah, I could say more, but maybe we can chat more about during the break. Yeah, so if you want to keep asking questions, come down and ask them, ask them during the break. Um, one more round of applause, and then let's head out for...